taxonomy is the science of categorizing. It's a very human endeavor. You know, you go home and pet your little puppy dog when you get home, he's not running around happy in the idea that he knows that he's home. He's Canis domesticus. It's the name we gave him. He doesn't know. Trees don't know where they belong. These bacteria doesn't know that it's bacteria. It's a very human thing. We have this need to organize. You can be the biggest slob on the planet. There will still come a point where you say, you know what, I really need to organize this whatever. It was nice. I used to share an office when I at my old school. And it was the best thing about sharing the office with four other people was I had the highest threshold of filth. So I never had to clean. Because somebody else would always be more aggravated by the mess before I was, so it was a wonderful thing. I don't get away with that at home because my wife has a much lower threshold, but it doesn't matter. It's still going to mean that I'm not taking care of Two key words to success in life. Yes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about classification. Understanding the world around us. One of the things that makes it easier is you have to understand it's all made up. Things are called what they're called because somebody decided to call it that. Does it matter? No. But that's why you're going to notice that the idea is going to evolve and change over time. Ideally, as we get more data. It's one of the things I love about being a scientist. I'm never wrong. I just change my opinion based on new data. It's a great thing. So really, the father of taxonomy is Carlos Linnaeus. <coughs> Some of his stuff went away, but a lot of it has stayed. He came up with the idea of binomial nomenclature, which is a fancy way of saying everything gets two names. Binomial meaning two, nomenclature meaning name. The scientific name for everything has two names. It has a genus name, G-E-N-U-S, and it has a species. The genus name lets you know who you're related to. And then the species name lets you know specifically which individual we're talking about. So again, the genus lets you know who you're related to. The species is the individual we're talking about. For example, we talked about the fact you might be lucky enough to go home and play with a puppy dog. That's Canis domesticus. He wouldn't want to go home and play with his cousin, Canis lupus, because that's a North American gray wolf. I want to go play with a gray wolf. They're great fun. Their idea of playing is hip checking you, grabbing by you by the throat, throwing you on the ground. It's not a good plan. Both Canis, they're both related to that dog group. But domesticus is one species, lupus. It was really easy being a taxonomist in Linnaeus' time. Because in Linnaeus' time, there were only two kingdoms. And it was based on appearance. You were either a plant or you were an animal. If you moved, you were an animal. If you didn't move, plant. Made life kind of simple. You spat, stared at things for a little while, didn't move, plant. Move, animal. That's why it's interesting. If you look at his original things, things like mussels, plants. Snails were plants. Because when do you see things like mussels and oysters more often? No, well, you might see them when they're dead. Dead things don't count. But if you go down to the ocean, you see them at low tide, right? Well, if you look at a mussel at low tide, what's it doing? Nothing. Plant. <laughs> in Linnaeus' time, Venus flytraps, they were animals. Because look at it, every once in a while it snaps closed. But that was the way it was. His big claim to fame that lasted several hundred years was this organizational theory. And if you graduated high school more than 10 years ago, this is the system you learned. If you graduated within the last 10 years, you know that we're missing a step. 
But kingdom was the broadest category, then phylum, then class, order, family, genes, and species. And there are lots of little set sentences to help you remember it. You know, king played chess on flat green stools. King Philip came over from Great Spain. There are a couple of other filthy that I can tell you about. But that was the order of things. Again, starting most general. We're starting at the animal kingdom, then we go to file, and then we go to class, etc. In fact, your book probably has a list in there about a genealogical breakdown. But it's getting more and more specific. And that worked for a while. But after him comes Ernest Haeckel. And Haeckel says, looking at things based on appearance is stupid. And Haeckel says we need to take a phylogenetic approach. We have to look at things based on their evolutionary relatedness. How closely are they related in an evolutionary process? Now, does that mean Linnaeus was a moron? No. Why didn't Linnaeus use evolution as the underpinning of Well, you're right, he didn't realize it, but why? Yes, he, Linnaeus was before evolution was a thing. Once evolution comes to be as an accepted theory, now people say, well, maybe we should use that accepted theory to understand the process. And then the other thing Haeckel does <coughs> is he introduces a third kingdom. And it's interesting because his kingdom really serves the same purpose now as it did then. Protists become the other kingdom. You find something that's not quite a plant, but it's not quite an animal, it's protists. Which is true even today. When we first find things, if we don't know exactly where they go, it's protists. Once we figure it out, we usually move them, but protists is kind of that, that catch-all category. Last guy one we'll get to. A little further along, we get Robert Whitaker. And he develops the five kingdom system that most of you either are aware of or most of us grew up on. He had a kingdom on era, which were all of the prokaryotes. Kingdom Protista to find a little more into algae and protozoa, which are single celled eukaryotes. Algae are the plant like protists, protozoa are the animal like protists. You'll learn way more about them than we you want to know in the last lecture. The last lecture is all protists. He also introduced the kingdom called fungi. They are uni or multicellular. They don't have a tissue level of development. They have cell walls made of chitin, which makes them different than the plants, which have cell walls made of cellulose. In fact, fungi originally were classified as plants. Because their cell walls are composed of chitin, and plant cell walls are composed of cellulose. <clears throat> the 
the fourth kingdom were plants or plantae. Those are the eukaryotic autotrophs. And then lastly, the animals, which are the eukaryotic heterotrophs. And rather than just looking at evolutionary or presumed evolutionary relatedness, Whitaker is the one who starts advocating using DNA and biochemistry to determine relatedness. And again, it's a matter of new data because in Haeckel's time, he didn't understand the role of DNA or biochemistry. So as those new technologies emerged, then we start adapting them to our classification. All right, we're caught up pretty good. We have two slides left of what was technically tonight's lecture. So when we talk about question four, and it talks about the evolution of the classification system, you can get through Whitaker, you just won't be able to get to Wolf, and Wolf will cover next week. All right, have a